Cord. So this is chapter 14 of the book of Eli. This is general pharmacology. What a New York State EMT needs to know and needs to be aware of. So there are a few important words. We should know a medication is a chemical or a drug uh, that is used in an EMS situation. Um, I think that you should know these two words, agonist and antagonist. An agonist binds and stimulates one of the receptors. So the simplest example is caffeine. For many people, they drink caffeine, they immediately have a sympathetic response. They wake up, they speed up, they, a lot of people can't sleep after caffeine intake. And it doesn't have to be coffee, even though that is obviously the most famous uh, source, but it could also be chocolate. And it can be these energy drinks that are very common uh, that people take. Also, there's a, a product called Five Hour Energy, a tiny little uh, bottle that is packed, packed with caffeine. Uh, there's teas that are full of caffeine. Also, it's not just coffee, but these are agonists. These are agonists. These are stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. And we learned when we did neurology, we touched on it. We spoke about the sympathetic nervous system. It makes you speed up. It makes things happen. So anybody that uh, uses caffeine in any way is using a sympathetic agonist. The opposite is an antagonist. And this is some medication or something that blocks her energy that blocks a receptor. And the, the, the one that I'm going to give you as an example will be a drug called Narcan. We're going to get to it tonight. We're going to talk about it. And that blocks opioid receptors uh, in the body and can change the outcome, hopefully from bad to good. So these two words, agonist, stimulates antagonist blocks. Dose is how much you should use, and action is the way that it's supposed to work, what it's supposed to do. So what is the action? And we're going to show you tonight, we're going to speak about different actions of different drugs. Um, indication, contraindication. So these are important words in medicine. Indication means I should use this drug at this time. For example, if you come to a patient and they are wheezing, it would be indicated to give the patient a drug called albuterol that you will all be carrying. So again, when is something indicated? When it's a good reason to give that drug. You have the proper criteria for using that drug. And it's indicated. So that's just what an indication means. Is it indicated to use X, Y, or Z? All right, that's the way the word's used. The opposite is contraindication, but it's a little more complex. There is a drug called aspirin. Every EMT carries a drug called aspirin. Okay, when is it indicated? So you need to know when it's indicated. So it's indicated in any patient who is having cardiac chest pain. And we'll talk about it both now soon and later in cardiology. But for now, just accept that it's indicated in a patient having cardiac chest pain. What if they tell you, uh, I'm allergic to aspirin? Happens. 
not the most common allergy, but it happens. Oh, all of a sudden, your drug becomes contraindicated. So you need that there should be an indication. You need that it should be the right drug at the right time for the right patient. However, because of circumstance, you can no longer use it. And you're going to see this with various drugs as we talk tonight. Side effects are things that happen that you weren't expecting. Ellie, I'm sorry. I have a question. What do you mean? You cannot use it anymore. You don't use it accordingly to the law now, or you do it just at certain times? Aspirin. I don't understand the question. Let me repeat. Any patient who is having cardiac chest pain right. gets aspirin. Okay. Except oh. that patient now tells you they are allergic to aspirin. Ah, got it. I'm sorry. Thanks for indicated. Try to listen because I, I said that already. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. Side effect. The side effects that are good, and there are side effects that are bad. Just you should know, in general, every drug has a side effect. Some are so small, benign, unnoticeable, okay? And some are really bad. So side effects are things that happen different from what you were expecting. That's called a side effect. Okay. It's pretty simple to understand. Drugs have two names for every drug. And I have two pictures here that I took just to show you the difference between them. There is the trade name drug this is the name that most of you are familiar with. So if you know a drug, you probably know the trade name. Trade names are things like Motrin, Advil, Tylenol, Aleve. These are trade name um, drugs. These are drugs that have the name owned, patented, copyrighted, etc etc et you cannot decide oh i'm gonna make bob's tylenol because there's a company that owns the name tylenol okay but what if you want to make bob's tylenol how could you go around that and if you go into any big box store costco bj's target cbs all these types of stores, you will see on the same shelf a drug with it, the generic name that isn't owned by anybody. So here I took two pictures. This is the drug Aleve. It is one of my favorite uh, muscle and pain killing drugs for anything, not a headache but it's a very good drug. One pill is the same as two, three, or even four Advil. So it's very powerful, very strong, and very good. But the word Aleve is a trade name, so you can't make it. So what did um, BJ's do? They made their own. Look at the difference when it comes to price. The Aleve is $19.99 for 20 pills, right? Or whatever you get in there. Look at what BJ's did. They charge $12 and you're getting 400 pills. How do I know they're the same? Because you need to know what is the ingredient that makes a leaf work. The ingredient is sodium naproxen. So if you go and now you go and make your own sodium naproxen and you call it Bob sodium naproxen, you're good. You can do that. 
and it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. It's no worse, no different. I buy generic name drugs all the time. The other famous one that people have with kids is Benadryl. Everybody should have a bottle of Benadryl if you have a kid, you have kids at home. We'll talk about it. It's not an EMS drug for EMTs, but it's a good drug as a parent. Um, the, the active ingredient is called diphenhydramine. So you can go to Walmart, you can go to CVS, you can go to Target, you can buy diphenhydramine for a third of the price as the brand name Benadryl. So learning about the two different names of drugs is something that takes years and years to get lots of, you know, many, many drugs, but that's fine. It takes time, but it's good to know which is the generic and which is a trade name. Every single prescription that somebody is on, there is both. And the pharmacies, guess what they're giving you? They're giving you the generic one. It always works like that. It's cheaper for them. It's cheaper for you. It's cheaper for the insurance company. So everybody wins. A prescription, obviously, is a drug that you need a script, needs to be given by a physician. And OTC are things like Tylenol, Aleve, Advil, Motrin, that you can buy OTC over the counter. All right, not as important, drugs come in solids, semi-liquids, liquids and gases. Don't think you'll be tested on knowing that, but it's here if you wanna see what are the different um, ways that medication comes. Okay, there are two ways to get medication into the human body. Okay, and we split them up like this, enteral, parenteral, okay? These are big words. These are words used in medic school, but they're medical words, and you should know them. Enteral. With the salt in them. Enteral means that it's entering the body through the digestive system. Remember, the digestive system has an in and an out, okay? If you're not sure where they are, maybe we need to do a little anatomy review, but normally we know where the digestive system goes in and goes out. So you can put drugs into the digestive system and that will be an enteral drug. All the other drugs are called parenteral. And just to give you examples, oral or PO is the medical term for putting something in someone's mouth. This is performed by EMTs and this is enteral because it goes in the mouth. Sublingual means under the tongue. There's one drug we're gonna talk about that you can use at certain times, goes under the tongue, sublingual, and yes, can be done by EMTs. The third one is PR, per rectum, and there is one case now, the state added one thing where an EMT can do that. I'll talk about it. So these are the enteral routes. Parentero, we have a whole bunch, but only these three can be done by EMTs. Inhalation, just think of oxygen. Think of your nebulizer. These are all inhaled medications. So yes, performed by EMTs. Intranasal means in the nose. And there's one drug you can use performed by EMTs. Intramuscular means with a needle into a muscle. And there is one drug where you can do this, though performed by EMTs. The rest are all not done by EMTs. They would be left for the medics. So you do have quite a few here that you should know what they are, what they mean, 
and where the drug is going. All right, so here is the list of available medications that are legally allowed to be given in New York State by EMTs. This is it. All right, so we'll go through first administer. That's when you actually carry these drugs in your kit. And they are oxygen, obviously, you can give oxygen. It's inhaled. Albuterol, we showed you the other night, skill night, right? How to use albuterol. Glucose, we'll talk about it, goes PO in the mouth. Aspirin gets chewed up and goes also in the mouth. Epinephrine goes with a needle, IM. And the newest one, Narcan, goes IN. So N for Narcan, N for nasal. And we're going to talk about these drugs. So this is what an EMT can carry in their bags, all right? Two, the bottom two were removed. Well, New York City removed them probably 20 years ago. But New York State just removed them recently, probably in the 2020 update. So these two, I left them on the page because just in case anybody asks, but these were removed, okay? So you don't need to learn them. You don't need to know about them, really. Now, assisted means that you don't carry it in your kit. The patient may have one. And if you follow the proper rules and regulations, which I'm going to show you, you can help the patient with their own medication. So the first one I got here is nitroglycerin. You don't carry it, but many patients do. We're going to speak about it at length tonight. It goes sublingual under the tongue. An inhaler, which people call inhalers, but really they're called MDIs, meter dose inhalers. That's the full name. And it goes by inhalation. So they breathe it in. That you can help a patient with. And then the rectal diazepam, which some parents of children with seizure disorder may have. The parent may not be able to administer it, may be freaking out, and you're allowed to assist with that, but you don't carry as a drug. So these are the drugs. We're going to talk about all of these tonight. Before I get into the drugs, I want to talk about this machine called a pulse ox. So this machine became very, very popular during COVID. Everybody and their grandmother bought one, got one, was given one, whatever. So honestly, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of the pulse ox machine for a couple of reasons. Reason number one, if you don't touch your patient and get a sense of the pulse, you can get a number from the pulse ox machine, but you will never know if it's regular or irregular. And that's something that's so important. You will also have a problem getting a read on the skin if you don't touch the patient. So the first problem I have with them is there's a lack of patient interaction from EMTs. If I come on call, you request medics, and the patient has a heart rate of 120, 130, whatever it is, the first thing I'm going to ask you, is it regular or irregular? And you're going to be like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. How should I know? Well, of course you should know. Put your finger on the radio pulse and figure it out. Is it regular? Is it irregular? Is it irregularly irregular? Or is it regularly irregular? I want to know. 
I'm taking over from you, this is something I want to know. Paul Sachs will not give you this information. There's the first problem with it. The second problem is that you have to understand that they do not measure oxygen. What do you mean? It's called a pulse ox. I will say it again. They do not measure oxygen. So what do they do? What do they measure? So they measure how much gas is connected to the hemoglobin molecules in the red blood cells. Okay, oxygen's a gas, but so is carbon monoxide, and so is cyanide. So there are a lot of false high readings. Remember, an asthmatic could be dying with a pulse oximetry reading of 99. And all you're doing is looking at the machine, then your patient is going to die. Um, somebody that was in a fire that inhaled cyanide. Cyanide is a poison. It comes from burning um, drapes, carpets, etc. Well, the cyanide will bind to the hemoglobin and the CO2, the um, P, uh, SPO2, the um, pulse ox, will read 98, 99. Same thing with CO poisoning, carbon monoxide. So if you don't know what you're doing and you're just relying on these machines, you can end up having a problem with your patient. Don't rely on them. If your patient looks really bad and you're giving them oxygen and you want to put it on to see how bad and you see a number 72, well, then they better be getting 15 liters on a non-rebreather and you need to watch the number come up from 72 to 74, 75, et cetera, until we get above 94, because we want our patients above 94. More than 94, we don't care about so much, all right? But we want to be above 94. Um, just be careful. Everybody's got one. They're available on Amazon for $10 or whatever it is. Also, if you have a, a female patient with, with nail polish, especially uh, red, they don't work. They give false readings. And if you have a patient with cold hands, fingers, these don't work and you'll get false readings. So there's so much to think about when you use one of these. Look at the patient, assess the patient, help the patient. Don't look at numbers on these things. Is there a better machine or a different machine that they use? No, 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 there isn't a better machine. This is a little bit about hemoglobin. You want to talk about uh, pulse rate for a minute? I did. What's Second number is the heart rate. What's the first number? The SPO2. Right. Okay. And then what, what, what metrics do you like to see between one and one? I like to see not using this machine. But okay, so we want to see 60 to 100. You said 94 and above. Yeah, 94 and above on the SPO2. Okay, and then on the rates, you want 60 to 100. 100, right. But okay, but I can only see the SPO2 on this machine. I can't see it myself. What? 
I can't see the SPO2 with my naked eye. I need a machine. Yes, you need to look at the patient. Are they breathing okay or are they <laughs> not? Okay. Are they dying? Are they in respiratory distress? Are they an asthmatic who is struggling? I don't need a machine for that. Right. Okay. You're saying you, you don't, an SPO2 number doesn't, doesn't tell you much. Unless it's like in the 60s or the 70s, but you should know that it was down low without even putting it up. Got it. Okay. Okay. Again, you should be talking and dealing with the patient. You see that they are struggling to breathe. You should make the decision to put them on oxygen. Now, you want to see the SPO2? Fine, put it on. Where are we? 89. We just got to get it to 94. If we're at 64, we we need to, you know, get it up. But again, you should know the patient is struggling just from looking and talking to them. You don't need to know this per se, it's just, I'm just explaining because people often ask, what is hemoglobin? These are the abbreviations, either HB or HGB. Um, some people have low levels hemoglobin, some people have high. Um, I just say one thing, you, you won't know. You need to do a blood test and get the basic panel back to know this, but if somebody has low hemoglobin, then they're probably bleeding from somewhere. And if there's no blood on the outside, then probably an internal bleed. So it's a great test, it's always done in the hospitals. All right, let's talk about drugs. First one is oxygen. We showed it to you the other day. Oxygen has different masks, has to be green, has to be within the date, right? Within five years of the date, print stamped in it. You need a regulator. You can use a non-rebreather, nasal cannula, BVM. Um, that's really what you need to know. All right, these are all different MDIs that you may see that patients have. Um, I know that I know that during COVID, uh, for example, in Toronto, they were using these instead of nebulizers. I don't know if they still are doing that. Um, we're back to nebulizer. What, sorry? We're back to using nebulizer if we okay. want to. So that was a decision made by their medical director because we knew of, eventually we knew of the problems of nebulizing medications. Um, we never went to this. So EMTs in New York were not carrying these. So again, these are MDIs and any asthmatic patient will have one or two or more of these at home. Uh, you come in and they tell you it's in the kitchen. Could you bring it? Let me use it. Then go right ahead. Check it's theirs, their name. Check it's not expired. And let them use it 100%. That's called assisting them with their medication. You carry the same medication. Our way actually is better, the way that we showed you the other day. It is better. However, this is quicker. You need to use this with an older child, a teenager or an older person, and they need to put their lips around the edge of the nebulizer, uh, the edge of the MDI, where the cap comes off. You press the medication bottle down, one spray, and then they are to hold it in their mouth and then breathe it into their lungs. Now, very small children, 
And, um, you know, anybody like a year or older will have a hard time explaining that to them and getting them to do it. And even children four, five, six can have a hard time with it. So the, they will get prescribed this piece called a spacer, MDI spacer, and it all clips together easily. I will hopefully show you one and you spritz the medication into the spacer. Spacer has a mask at the end. And whenever they breathe in next, they will breathe in the medication. That's all it is. So it's used for small children that, you know, cannot get the medication deep into their lungs. This is something, again, we do not carry it, but you can use it. All right, we showed you this the other night. This is albuterol. This is a nebulizer. Comes in these vials, one vial per patient for use. You squeeze it into here. I know Cosmo showed it to you. You squeeze it into here. You plug it in, four to six liters usually, and you want to see a mist. You want to see a mist. Then you know that the medication is coming out. There is a pipe style where you give it to the patient to breathe through. In and out, again, younger patients or patients that cannot follow instructions, may you may need to um, get one of these masks. It's actually part of a non-rebreather. You pull off the reservoir, you destroy a non-rebreather, and you clip that piece on to the top of the nebulizer, and you can put it over their face, and they'll breathe it in. So this is the drug. Now, what does albuterol do? Well, we spoke or somebody spoke to you about the problem of asthma, right? The problem, biggest problem with asthma is bronchospasm. That's where the bronchi or the bronchioles start to twist and turn on themselves. There's mucus production all going on at the same time. And typically the patient cannot breathe out. Out is always the problem. And we call it an expiratory wheeze. So the biggest problem is an expiratory wheeze. The problem with asthma is bronchospasm. That's the word you need to know about asthma. Bronchospasm is where the bronchioles turn and twist on themselves and they get filled with mucus. And the problem is what's called an expiratory wheeze. Uh, expiratory wheeze is heard by putting a stethoscope on the patient's back in the upper and lower lobes of the lungs. And this is the problem with asthma. Now, albuterol, this drug can be given to any patient that is wheezing. So it doesn't matter if they have a history or they don't have a history, if they were diagnosed, if they were not diagnosed. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to you now. If they are wheezing, you should treat them. Now, one of the biggest problems people have, um, especially new EMTs, is that the dispatcher who is sitting in an office or a basement or whatever, puts out a call for a patient wheezing. They don't know if the patient is wheezing. So who said the patient's wheezing? You know who said it? The person that called. The person that called doesn't know either. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb, and yeah, you could argue with me, but... I'm going to make this uh, pretty much a rule. You cannot hear wheezing without a stethoscope. 
you want to argue with me, I'll accept. And very rare cases you can. But for the most part, you need to look at the patient. You'll see they're having a hard time breathing. You need to put a stethoscope on their back. Remember, arm, skin. No stethoscope over clothing. Ever, ever, ever. I don't care if you're doing this two minutes or two days, like me, on skin. And you need to listen, and you need to close your eyes, and you need to block out all the sounds and only listen. Uh, wheezing is difficult for EMTs. They don't get enough practice, but it's a very high-pitched whistle sound. And usually when the patient is breathing out, expiratory, usually. If you hear a sound when you walk in the room, <laughs> right, like that, that's not wheezing. That's called strider. And that's a completely different situation or problem. Okay? So let's get it straight from the beginning that wheezing we need to listen to it we need to hear it with a stethoscope okay and if you hear it when you walk in the room i'm gonna not a betting man but i would put money on it that it's not wheezing again there are cases when yes you can hear it but it's very very rare so stethoscope, listen. Just because the mom says that the child is wheezing, she may have heard strider. She may have heard all sorts of other noises. What is the action of the drug albuterol? How does it work? Well, one word, bronchodilator. And you need to know this. Albuterol works because it is a bronchodilator. Let's break the word down. First part of the word is bronco, right? It refers to all the pipes, all the pipes from the carina where it's where the trachea splits into two, all the pipes to all the alveoli. Those are all bronco. Dilator, make bigger. So bronchodilator, so we're making bigger the pipes. Remember. What was the problem with that with an asthmatic? Bronco spasm. So this is a great drug. It's a great drug to help them open up the airways. Remember, wheezing is a lower airway problem, a lower airway problem. And typically cannot be heard without a stethoscope. Typically. Okay. Um, there really are no, no contraindications. It sort of changed to considerations. And you should be careful if you think is you you think that your patient is having an active M on. If you think the patient's having an active MI right there and then when you get there, then don't give it to them. Get medics, get them to a hospital. But it's very complicated because there is something called a cardiac wheeze, also a very rare occurrence that you have to really decide how you're going to treat it. So get medics if, if you can for those those cases, extreme cases. You can give two albuterol treatments and a third one en route. Do not delay transport. Obviously, you need to get these patients to a higher level of care. Medics have a lot more drugs that they can use. And um, if you don't have medics around, then just 
move and give them a butyrol en route. They will typically get tachycardia, side effect of the bronchodilator, but nothing to be too concerned about if you want to give it. We have a contraindication in Toronto. If the patient's febrile, we can't use a nebulizer. So I'll explain that. I'll explain that. Um, and it, it's very good. It's a very good contraindication. What your medical director is saying that asthmatics are not sick. They don't have a fever. They don't have a virus. They don't have a problem like a pneumonia, all right? They just have bronchospasm, they can't breathe. So it's not a New York State contraindication, but I think it's something that you should take on for yourselves. That again, you need to make a full picture and a full assessment of your patient. Full assessment. Um, there's no reason to give somebody with a pneumonia or bronchitis albuterol. So I like that Toronto has that. We do not have that in New York State. But it is something that we would look for and we would be careful about. Good. Am I sharing the screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Glucose. So this is another machine that I have my doubts about whether it's a good idea or not. So I'm going to say two contradictory statements. Number one, if your patient, well, you know what, we didn't do the diabetic lecture. We didn't do it yet. So when you get the diabetic lecture, you'll hear that it's very easy to decide that your patient is hypoglycemic. So it's in my book, it's whatever, there's a chart, it's not difficult. Meaning if you're gonna play around and not treat them until you get a BGL and you know blood glucose level, again, it bothers me in a way. The opposite or contradictory statement I'm gonna make is that I think you should take, if you have the machine, you should take a BGL on like every patient encounter. It should become one of your vital signs. So if you have the machine and you have the ability and you're allowed to draw blood one thing or another, you should take one on every patient and document it. On the other hand, if there's a true hypoglycemic emergency, I don't know. I don't even always use it. Like if it's a patient I know that's a diabetic and they're comatose and they're, you know, full pound diaphoretic, they were AMS, the family called, I know what's wrong. I don't even need to take a BGL. Yes, now BLS can do it. So, you know, it used to be that only medics had this. And I didn't bother, I didn't always bother, I didn't always waste time if I knew the patient. If you don't know the patient, yeah, then you can take, take it. Uh, the numbers we'll talk about in a later lecture, I don't want to get into all the diabetic stuff, but it was lowered now to 60. 60 or below is severe hypoglycemia. 60 to 80 can be called hypoglycemia if they have signs and symptoms. So either way, you're just giving them 15 grams of sugar. I recommend if they are conscious, 
that you find some juice in the house, maybe orange, apple, grape juice, doesn't matter. Squeeze that whole tube into a cup, stir it up, and hand them the cup. Do not feed it to them. If they're not conscious enough to drink it themselves, it's contraindicated. That simple. Contraindicated. That means, yes, they should get it. Yes, they need it. No, you can't do it. Everybody understands this, right? This is we spoke about the term contraindicated. So if they are unresponsive, comatose, semi-responsive, have no gag reflex, do not give them anything to drink. It will get stuck and you'll have a choking and a bigger diabetic problem on your hand. So that's the drug, that's the way it comes, like a tube of glucose, tube of small tube of toothpaste. Um, that's what it looks like, comes in another style also. We'll show you on a skill night, um, all these drugs. Aspirin. Aspirin is only given to a patient with cardiac chest pain. Cardiac chest pain. Not a patient involved in a MVA, a motor vehicle accident, whose seatbelt tightened, maybe saved their life, but now they've got a pain in the chest from the seatbelt. Do you understand the difference? Pain in the chest or chest pain? Tonight we're going to do the next lecture. We're going to talk about cardiac chest pain and how we can identify it a little better. But for now, if you think it's cardiac chest pain, they get and they're not allergic to aspirin. You've got to ask always, right? Contraindication, allergic. You give them four of these pills. Each pill has 81 milligrams in it, four times 81, and the total dose is 324 milligrams. So these are things you could be asked, 324 milligrams. Um, that would be the dose. Does aspirin work for high cholesterol as well? Just no. curiosity. No, 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 no. Nothing to do. What is the property of aspirin? Why are we giving it? And why only the, the chewable used to be called baby aspirin? Why? So the answer to that is very simple. It does not relieve the heart attack. It does not prevent the heart attack. When we give it, it's because the heart attack has occurred. And we don't want it to get worse. So we're going to anticoagulate the blood, which I guess means thin the blood, right? By giving four of these and having them chew it up. Chewing it up gets into the bloodstream the quickest. Quicker than swallowing with, you know, a cup of water. That can take 45 minutes. This can take five to 10 minutes after they chew it. Um, we want to prevent, we're going to talk about plots and, and one thing or another later, the next lecture, but for now, just understand why we give the drug, anticoagulation, and hopefully we'll make the heart attack less. There shouldn't be any more. Um, clotting at that site and we're going to talk about it we'll talk about it but now just learn what the drug is used for epinephrine so the first thing we got to understand is that there are two words that are connected to epinephrine and they're big words and you've got to know them number one bronchodilator 
Okay, what else was a bronchodilator? Another drug. Anyone know? Albuterol. Albuterol, amazing. So this can also be used after you give a couple of albuterols. If you're still not getting satisfaction, you can go to epinephrine for the tight asthmatic who is wheezing, who is not getting better from the albuterol. Great. So we have bronchodilator, but it also vasoconstricts. So we have both things going on in one drug. If you remember the shock lecture, it was a few weeks ago, but I spoke about a category of shock called distributive shocks. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Hope you do. But the distributed shock problem was vasodilation. The pipes got too big. They widened for whatever reason. Here, we're going to vasoconstrict and put them back to the way they're supposed to be. Now, What's the problem with vasodilation? The problem is that blood pressure is going to go down. And then they're going to end up in anaphylactic shock. So we use this drug, epinephrine, uh, which does bronchodilation or vasoconstriction. You need to know these two words. The dose, you need to know the dose for adults and for children. For adults is 0 0.3 milligrams and for children, 0 0.15. These are the New York State doses. I have heard of other doses from other parts of the country, but this is what you need to know. The side effect of this drug is tachycardia because this is a sympathomimetic. This stimulates the sympathetic nervous system and therefore will cause tachycardia. Um, we don't care, obviously, if the patient is having anaphylaxis or can't breathe because of wheezing. So we're going to use this drug. There's always a question that is asked when to use it, when not to use it. So here's my take. If it's a young person, let's say 40 and under, don't even hesitate. If you think that they, even if you just think they're going to go into anaphylaxis, use it. Because there's really nothing bad that can happen. If your patient is 82 with a cardiac history, yeah, you better make sure that they need this drug. It better be 100%. So that's the way that I look at it. If they're young, younger, whatever word you want to use, no cardiac history, they're having anaphylaxis, just use the EpiPen. That's my opinion. Um, the use of it, we'll talk about it when we talk about allergic reaction lecture, but I want to say that it got much more liberal, much easier to use. Basically, if two body systems are involved in the anaphylactic shock, you can use Epi. Two, so itchy, scratchy skin is one, and vomiting is a second. You'd be able to use it. you got two body systems. If they can't breathe and they got itchy, scratchy skin, there's two body systems. And obviously, if they're hypotensive, means that blood pressure has dropped, you don't need another body system. Just use it. So we'll talk about this more when we 
talk about um, anaphylaxis, but this drug is called epinephrine, comes in auto-injectors, and it comes in vials, ampules. We'll talk about it. All right, one of the latest drugs to be added to the EMT's arsenal is called Narcan or Naloxone. Remember, Narcan would be a trade name, Naloxone would be a generic name. And it usually comes in a box like this. Uh, in the box will be two items, this medication, and this is called a shooter. The problem is you need three items to use this drug correctly. You need one of these, all right? You need one of these. These do not come in this box. So wherever you're keeping your drugs, you'll get a box like this, but you gotta make sure you have an atomizer, okay? This is an atomizer and it screws right onto the top of your syringe. And this goes screws into here. The yellow caps come off, the red cap comes off, this screws in here, and this will become, you can place your atomizer on the end. It's a spritz? Yeah, look at the top picture. Uh. So this is the one that goes inside a patient's nose. Uh, we're going to put half the syringe in one nostril, half the syringe in the other nostril. Uh, that's the way it's given. If you don't have the atomizer, then you will not get that fine mist. You will just get liquid being shot out. It'll shoot up the nose and out the nose at the same time. Um, the fine mist that the atomizer produces allows the mucosal membranes in the back of the nose to take the drug in. That's how you use it. Again, you need three items, the box or the two items in the box and the um, uh, the um, atomizer, okay? It also has a, uh, a short name, but whatever, I don't see it. MAD, mucosal atomization device. Most people just call it an atomizer. All right, let's talk. What's the other one, the Narcan picture? Okay, the four milligrams? Yeah. Okay, so this was given out by New York State for free to any agency that is not part of a municipality. So FDNY could not get this, um, but, you know, uh, Bob's Ambulance Company could, all right? So, and basically it's one piece, it goes up the nose and it has four milligrams, twice the normal dose, and it all goes in one shot. You cannot do part of a shot, half the shot, nothing. It has no control. You push up the bottom and it shoots out the whole four milligrams of the drug into one nostril. So in, in, normal, in a normal circumstance, the original way, it's one milligram in each nostril or two milligrams in each nostril? Yeah, one milligram in each nostril. Okay. Let me explain to you about the drug. Let me explain to you what it does. So if a patient has overdosed on opioids, opioids come from the poppy plant. There are many, many legal opioids and a couple of illegal ones. The most famous illegal one is, of course, heroin. Now they brought in illegal fentanyl, which is a legal drug uh, just as well. But the one they brought in is illegal. Fentanyl is very, very strong. 
and many, many people died in New York State from fentanyl overdoses. There are other drugs too that are made of opioids. Um, the, the lowest is Tylenol codeine, um, and then they go up to oxycodone, oxycontin, morphine, fentanyl, delorted. All these have opioids in them. Okay, what do we do with this drug? When do we give it? Who do we give it to? So there's two parts to the answer. Part one is, did they take opioids? Or did they take some other drug? Nothing to do. There's a very simple way to find out. Open the eye and then open the other eye. What do we expect to see if they took opioids? We expect to see constricted, tiny pinpoint pupils. We do not use a pen light. We just will open the eye, the eyelid, and we see what do the pupils look like. If the pupils are huge or normal, they probably did not do opioids. Don't give Narcan. So that's A. B, what happens if a guy walks out of a party and says to you, yeah, they called for me because I did a ton of fentanyl. Does he get Narcan? So you can look in his eyes and you'll see tiny pinpoint pupils. My question is, does he get Narcan? The answer is no, because they've got to be having respiratory distress. They've got to be having a breathing problem. Remember, the opioids will affect the brain stem, which houses the ability for the brain to send messages to breathe. So if they are not breathing or they're breathing really slowly or they're not breathing adequately in any way and they've got the pinpoint pupils, then you want to give them the Narcan. Be careful with the Narcan. There are some serious side effects, which they don't always tell EMTs. Number one, they can vomit violently. So make sure you have appropriate receptacles for them to vomit into. Number two, they can get very angry and very upset. And guess with whom? With you. So I'm just saying that give it to the right patient for the right reasons. Now, I give it IV. Usually, I do not do it this method. And IV, I can titrate and give slowly, slowly, tiny, tiny amounts until they're breathing on their own. I do not want to wake them up. I don't want to take them out of it. Because an unconscious patient is a great patient. However, a non-breathing patient is not a good patient. So this is something that you will have to, you don't have the choice of really titrating it. You've got to put one milligram in the left, one milligram in the right, which is half of what comes in your little box here. Okay, half of this two milligrams. All right, so you'll give till here, and then you'll give till here. I'll have I'll have him show you on a skill night exactly how to do it, what the mucosal 
uh, atom, animation device looks like or the atomizer. And it goes IN in the nose. Nitroglycerin, NTG, that's the abbreviation, the short for nitroglycerin. You know that medics are not writing words that long, so everything has abbreviations. Aspirin was ASA, nitroglycerin is NTG. Only assisted. That means that it is illegal for an EMT to carry this drug in New York State. Illegal. Okay. Um, it's a very, very strong drug. And what it does is vasodilates. I will explain why you would want to give this to a patient. I'll explain later in the next lecture. It's used for cardiac chest pain. And very, very big contraindication here. The systolic blood pressure cannot be less than 120. Now, in the textbook, it does not say this. It says something else. Just go with what I tell you, okay? So they need to have a systolic blood pressure greater than 120. They need to own the medication. It needs to have their name on it. It's good if it's not expired. And you put one of these tiny pills, hopefully we'll show it to you, one of these tiny, tiny pills under their tongue, let it dissolve. Now, you want to take their blood pressure before and after you give this drug. You want to constantly reevaluate every two to three minutes. You want to reevaluate that blood pressure because it's very strong drug and it can take the blood pressure down by 60 points. So if they're at 140 and you give one and it drops by 60 points, now they're at 80. Now they're in shock. So use it if they have it, but be very careful. Be very careful how you use it. And for test questions, blood pressure must be above 120. In Toronto, we can't do it if it's below 140. Okay. I don't get how that works, though. If it's below 120, it drops 60, your patient is doomed. Right. That's why. No, you I'm can't. saying if, even if it's at 130. And I, tell, I tell my EMTs, if it's 120, don't give it. Wait for me. No, so what's the state? What do they say? the state number. The, the national number is even lower. You're putting the, I'm saying you're putting the, the, the patient into shock, though. Yeah, you could. Not you will. It's a possibility. Sometimes it only drops 10 or 20 points. Uh, okay. Every patient is different. These are called the seven rights of medication administration. If you go to medic school, you'll be tested on this over and over. Just putting it here for you to look at. Dr. Timed. You can, you know, look at it. You don't have to learn it. It's not going to be on your tests. But always remember, you need the right patient, the right drug, the right expiration, right dose, and right documentation. Remember, just basics. I think this table is out of date. It's from 2016. Um, there may be some changes needed, so I didn't work on it, uh, but everything here that I spoke about, it's still got serpivipic activated charcoal, um, not in New York City, but now not in New York State. You don't do these anymore, so you can cross them out. Um, everything else more or less there, so I wouldn't worry about this chart. I'd learn the drugs. Thank <laughs> you.